next Sunday. Praise the Lord. Turn to Luke. Luke chapter 7. Today I want to talk about some principles of faith from this passage of Scripture, or from Luke, from the book of Luke. I just want to encourage us this morning in our faith in God. We have a world that is going crazy. How many know that? Right? With all the things that are happening in the world, we just have to walk in a place of faith in the Lord and trust in the Lord. And I believe that today is a good day just to speak on that and encourage and build up our faith. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 to 9. That's where we're going to start reading from. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. says there, now you're going to know, if you're familiar with scriptures, you're going to know this passage and you're going to know this story. When Jesus had completed all his words in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion's servant was dear to him, who was sick and ready to die. When this centurion heard of Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they asked him earnestly, saying, You should do this for him, because he is worthy. For he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. So Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Isn't it interesting that the Jews, the, the religious leaders were saying, "You are This man is worthy of you coming and helping, and the first thing the centurion turns and says to Jesus, don't even come under my roof, for I'm not worthy. Just a thought. Just the humility there. Likewise, verse 7, I do not think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man placed under the authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. When Jesus heard these words, he marveled at him and turned and said to the people who followed him, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. This is an interesting passage of scripture. There's so much found in this passage. But I just want to talk this morning And just give us some ideas and thoughts and principles regarding faith. And the first principle that I want to talk about or just kind of speak to us over this morning is that faith is coming into agreement with not only that God exists, but faith is also coming into agreement with the nature of God. You know, There's an idea that sometimes people propagate, and that is faith is blind. That if you walk by faith, you are not walking by anything of worth of worth substance or of value. But how many know faith is never empty? Faith is not blind. Faith is not walking haphazardly. There's always something concrete. Or there's always of substance or something of substance to it. Faith, first of all, as Hebrews talks about, starts by believing in God. But this morning I want us to see that it moves from believing that God exists to a point of also that he is a rewarder of what? Those who what? Diligently seek him. So faith is not only believing in the existence of God, but it's also believing in the nature of God. And part of his nature is that he rewards those who diligently, and you could, you could put in a couple of other words in there, meaning eagerly or actively seek or pursue him. Another part of who God is is that he is good. How many know that? God is good. God intends good for our lives. Every good and perfect gift, what? 
comes from above. And faith is able to stand in that declaration even when things around us are not so good. You know, there's a lot of people in our world, even Christians, who think somehow that God is out to get them. That God is out to beat them down, so to speak. That's not who God is. It's interesting in this instance from the story, the centurion must have heard about the stories of Jesus. Otherwise, why would he send out people to come and to communicate with Christ so that his servant, whom he loved, could be healed? He must have heard. In this instance from the story, the centurion came into agreement with who Jesus was, his authority, and his nature. If I was to apply this principle in our life, or in my life, I would look at it in this way. In my walk of faith, me having a need from God, I need to be fully aware and find the supply for that need in Him. And understand that not only does God exist, but understand that as I diligently seek after Him, His nature is for me to receive from him that which I'm seeking him for. The questions that I would have for us today is this. Do we believe God rewards us as we diligently seek him? Do we really believe that? Which would lead me to this other thought, and I'm not pointing pink fingers. I'm just throwing it out there. And maybe you can just look at it in your own life and apply it to your own. So why don't we do it? I'm just, like, I'm talking Christians in general. If we really believe that God rewards those who diligently seek him, why don't we do it? Why do we look for everything else? Here's another question. Do we believe or have we come into agreement that God is good? That God wants to do good in our lives? You see, one of the big struggles that Christians often have is that they believe that some of the things that are in their lives is because God put it there and There is some truth to some things, but there is also falsehood to other things. Listen, God does not put sickness on people. That is something that I've had to dwell upon, you know, with my life and with what I've gone through in life. And I've had Christians, well-meaning Christians, come to me and tell me, you know, this is God's will for you. And I was like, okay, wonderful. God wants me to be in pain all my life. I promise you, if somebody ever comes to me and say that again, they will have a little discussion with me. Or God wants me to de- be depressed. No. That's not God. You may go through things. You may struggle through things. We are in a world that is fallen. We are not in a world that everything is rosy and wonderful. We have struggles. We deal with people. We deal with situations. We deal with circumstances. We have a body that does get sick because of sin and the fall and everything that has happened to it. But listen, I want us to understand this morning that God wants to do good in our lives. The second or third question, I guess you could say, do we agree that our only source of supply is God, which will lead us to diligently seeking him? 
So this morning, I, the first principle I just want to kind of throw at us this th- today is this. Faith is coming into agreement with not only God believing that he exists, but also believing and having faith and trusting in who he is. Secondly, second principle, faith is something that is activated and released in word through our mouths. Now, Christians don't like this one for a couple of reasons. Christians don't like it because there has been some extremes of you know, it's not so much today, the name it and claim it movement, okay? Some of the extremes that have gone into some of the word of faith stuff. Some don't like it because of the, also the kind of the new agey power of positive confession that leads to it, okay? There's also Christians who don't like it because, one, they lack faith. Let me, let me talk about the extremes of the word of faith or the New Age stuff. Because of the ex- extremes and evil cor- uh, corruptions, we have thrown out some scriptural principles, and that's not good. Okay? We'll get into it a little bit more. You don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. How many know that? Okay? It's like the Holy Spirit in some churches. People don't want the Holy Spirit in the church because... They're afraid of what the Holy Spirit will do, and they think that the Holy Spirit is somehow weird. He's not weird. People are weird. Okay? People are weird. And sometimes we have to instruct. We have to give wisdom. Sometimes we have to walk with people as they mature. But that doesn't mean we throw out the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. I was also saying that some Christians don't like this because of a lack of faith. Some people are like, well, what if the things that I'm speaking about don't happen? That's up to God. Faith is something that you are confident in to the point that you will speak what you believe. Notice the centurion's words, or the centurion's faith was released by the words he spoke to Christ. Listen, what you say is important. You know, the idea of, well, sticks and stones don't break my, or will break my bones, but words will never hurt me is completely false. Jesus in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 and 23 says this. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. For truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be thrown into the sea. Here's an interesting thought. Have you ever noticed this in scripture? He did not say pray to God and ask him to move the mountain. Have you ever seen that? He didn't say, pray and ask God to move the mountain. What did he say? Pray and speak to the mountain. Many Christians don't like that because they're, they think that we're being presumptuous, but actually this is the instructions of Christ himself to us regarding the mountains that we face in life. Speak to the mountain in the authority of Jesus Christ. And what will happen? He says, and if this person does this, be removed and be thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, and he will have whatever he says. Now we could spend a whole time on that last phrase, he will have whatever he says. I'll just say this. If your heart is in line with God, and you are in the word of God, you will only ask and speak the things that God desires and has for you. I could want a Ferrari. (laughs) Or as I've said, the Canary Yellow Turbo Porsche. 959, I think it is. This is higher. Outdated. You know, I can speak. I believe in that Porsche outside right now. (laughs) Yeah, it's not there, brother. Don't worry. (laughs) You 
you know. No, that's not what it, that's not what Scripture is saying. We are when we release and activate our faith with the words we speak. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. Because some of us believe the negative words that we speak. When we say we're a loser. When we say that we're a failure. When we say that we're no good. When we say that we can never overcome. When we say that we're not victorious. We say those words with faith behind it. You can tell what your faith is in the words that you speak. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, A good man out of the treasure of his heart bears what is good. An evil man out of the treasure of his heart bears what is evil. For out of the abundance of what? The heart, the mouth speaks. That's why the Bible says keep your heart with all diligence. Because the expression of faith of what's in the heart what we really believe, okay? Not what we believe up here. Because we can often quote the scriptures. How many know that Christians are really good at knowing what they are supposed to say around other Christians, but you get them in the privacy of their own home, or you get them going through a trial, or you get them in a place of absolute honesty, and what comes out of the heart actually comes forth, and it is different than what's up here. Faith is not of the heart, or is of the heart. It's not of the head. That's why we have to keep our heart with all diligence, because the expression of faith in our heart is often spoken out of our mouth. And what we need to declare is what the Word of God says, who God is, what Jesus accomplished. And what was the centurion's declaration? He declared who Jesus was. He declared the authority that Christ had. He said, but just speak the word. And my servant will be healed. All right, let's move on to another one. Luke chapter 8. One day, Jesus went into a boat with the disciples And he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. Then a wind and a storm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. They came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing, or we are dying. Then he rose, and he rebuked the wind and the raging water, and it ceased, and there was calm. And Jesus said to them, Where is your faith? It's interesting that they kind of ignored the question, if you want to say. And it says there, being afraid, they marveled, saying to each other, Who then is this man? He commands even the winds and water, and they obey him. I guess you could say this. The principle here that I would like to bring out is this. The trying of our faith will reveal its true nature. This, you know, this is an interesting story, because think about it. Jesus commands his disciples to go to the other side of the lake. This is not Peter. This is not, you know, one of the other disciples who said, let's go over. This is Jesus. This is a direct order from Jesus to say, let's go over. And in the middle of their travels, this storm comes up, and these disciples become fearful of dying. Here's a thought you can think about. Who sent the storm? Just thinking about that. It's an interesting thing that Jesus is awoken immediately, calms the storm, and then said, where is your faith? This kind of relates to what we talked about last week when we were talking about Moses and the children of Israel. If God calls you to do something, he will not send you into the storm for you to be destroyed. Just like last week, with remember Israel coming to the Red Sea? God led them there 
not for them to be destroyed. What did they think? Israel complained and turned around and said, Moses, why have you led us here? Is there not enough, is there not graves in Egypt that we could be buried in? Why did you bring us here? So if God calls you to do something, if God is working in your life, if God is directing you in your life, if he is leading you in your life and a storm comes along, it's not so that you can be destroyed. In fact, you, what you will find is that God will provide a way through the storm. You know, it's interesting when you think about the question that Jesus said, where is your faith? I wonder if Jesus was maybe asking the disciples, what do you really believe about me? Do you think that I'm actually bringing you to cross this lake just so that I can drown you? So, my thinking. The trial of our faith will certainly reveal in our heart how and what we believe about God. It will come out. And here's an interesting thing that sometimes we don't get, especially when we watch TV pastors or YouTube pastors. God never promised an easy life. He never promised there would be no problems. How many know that? He never promised there wouldn't be any storms. Sometimes I think that the way it's portrayed on television and YouTube, that if you become a Christian, life will just be a bed of roses. It's not true. And here's another interesting thought. If you want to walk in great faith, remember this. Great faith is usually a product of great fights. You can't develop great faith by it not going through problems and struggles and difficulties. It's kind of like exercising and, 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 and building up the body. It's the same thing in our spiritual walk. Our faith will only be built up and strengthened as we go through struggles and trials and difficulties. It is in the fights and it's in the storms. It's, it's, it's when you look back and you see God's faithfulness back there when you, he put, pulled you through that storm and now you're going through a storm today that you can look and say, I can stand strong because of what he has done. Here's another thought when you're going through the trying of your faith. It would seem that the disciples felt that they were in a hopeless situation. As a Christian, have you ever felt that you're in a hopeless situation? I would just say this as an encouragement. Every area of your life, that has no hope or looks hopeless is under the influence of a lie because it denies the influence and power of God over it. You know, I've spoken to you about my daughter, the one who's not leading a Christian life, who's walking away from, who's walked away from the Lord, who's following the lifestyles that are out there break my heart and some days I look at it as hopeless in the natural if you were to look at it from a natural standpoint it looks hopeless but I just trust the Lord and say God there is nothing impossible for you there is nothing impossible for you and devil you're a liar Number four, Luke 9, 10, 17, it says, When the apostles returned, they told Jesus all that they had done. They took him, they then took him and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. 
But when the crowds knew it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Verse 12, when the day began to end, the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowds away so that they can go into the towns and surrounding countryside and lodge and get food, for we are in a deserted place. Verse 13 says this, He said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five fish or five loaves and two fish. And unless we go and buy food for all these people, we have nothing then to feed them. That's my addition. There were about 5,000 men. But he said to the disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. They did so, and he made them sit, and they made them sit down. Then he took the five loaves and two fish and looked to heaven and blessed them and broke them and gave them to the disciples to eat, to set before the crowd. They all ate and were filled in 12 baskets of broken pieces that were main, were, that remained were collected. Let me say this. Walking in a place of faith is not only agreeing in the nature of God, but it's also c- coming into a place where we agree in what God has done in us and God can do through us. It's interesting that Jesus said, what? You feed them. Now you could look at it and say, well, was Jesus being sarcastic? No. I think what happened was the the, the disciples clearly didn't understand or realize that God had fully equipped them to fulfill the need that the people had. Think about this for a moment. Because of Christ in you. Not because you have anything. Not because I have anything. How many know that? We have nothing in ourselves. We lack nothing. We lack everything. But how many know there's also a change when we're we're united with Christ? It's interesting that Jesus didn't rebuke them, but seemed to demonstrate them the expectation that he had. He had the magnitude of the kingdom of God. I will say this. The kingdom of God is not just limited to healing the sick. It's not just limited to casting out demons. It's not just limited to deliverance. It's not just limited to the miraculous in that sense. It's not just limited to only salvation. But the kingdom of God has the ability to meet every need with an abundance that is unmatched. Some of you sitting here today, you don't necessarily need healing in your body. You've been saved. You don't necessarily need deliverance, but you have other needs in your life. Physical needs, jobs, finances, relational needs, other things that maybe are upon your heart that nobody knows about. But let me tell you something. God knows about it. And the kingdom of God has an abundance of all that we need. The Bible says what? I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. Colossians says this, you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. My question this morning was, are you aware of your place and position in the kingdom of God. Again, not because of who you are, but because of who Christ is in you. So many Christians cower and walk in fear and do not walk in confidence. Not confidence in themselves, confidence in God. Because they do not understand the authority and the place of power and the, and the position that God has placed you in because of Christ in their lives. Here's an interesting thought, too. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing when you think about how many disciples were there? Twelve. And how many baskets of food came up? Twelve. It's, I just think it's really interesting that God supplied all the needs of the people 
And then he turned around and gave, and if, if you want to say, each disciple a basket for themselves. So here's the thing that I think about regarding that. When we pour out of everything that God has given to us, everything that God provides in our life, sometimes we think, does God have enough for me? I just say yes. In fact, if you look at it, 12 baskets of food, they had more to start. They had more at the end than they started with. All right, last one. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. The woman with the issue of blood. And a woman having a hemorrhage for 12 years who had spent all her living on physicians. This is why I don't like doctors. <laughs> Just kidding. I hope you guys love me still. I had to see this. <laughs> Who spent all their living on positions but could not heal, be healed by any of them. Came behind him and touched the fringe of his garment and immediately her hemorrhage dried up. And Jesus said, who touched me? When everyone denied it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the crowds are pressing against you and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him before all the people why she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Verse 48. Then he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Kind of my last thought regarding the aspect of faith. Faith many times requires pressing in and pressing through until you attain the promise. It's no doubt that the woman probably heard the stories of the people, of touching of people touching Jesus and being healed, because if you read it in the other book, Mark 5.28, she said, She's saying in her mind, basically, if I just might touch his garments, I'll be healed. So she had this concept already before going to Jesus. She had already this concept in her heart, in her mind, that, listen, all I need to do is touch his garment, and I'll be whole. There was one problem. She wasn't there. And it was so full of people that it would seem the crowds almost crushed the people. I mean, as the disciples said, Jesus, when you turn around and say, who touched me, look at everybody. It's like you're walking through this crowded space with rubbing shoulders with so many different people. How can you turn around and say, who touched me? Everybody's touching one another at the same time. Think about this also, the woman's condition. She was probably very weak. Some suggest that she was even crawling. Because if you look in Matthew, it talks about her touching the hem of his garment, the very bottom of his garment. In any case, to go and touch Christ was not easy to do. It required pressing in. It required pressing through until she came to him and could reach out and touch him. That's why 1 Timothy 6 says this, fight what? The good fight of faith. We are not saved by works. I'll just get that clear. But let me tell you something. Faith requires work. In the sense of faith you know, will take us along a struggle where we have to press in. We will have to press through. We will, we will go through times where it feels like we're working for it. Some people think, oh, well, I have faith. If God wants me to have it, then he will do it. I don't, I'm not going to pursue after it. I'm not going to go after it. I'm not going to seek him. Because if he really wants me to have it, he'll give it to me. 
Remember what Hebrews says. God is rewarder of what? Those who diligently seek him. Was it God's will to heal the woman? Yes. Obviously. Did she believe that Jesus could heal her? Yes. Let me ask you this question. If she hadn't pressed through and touched his garment, would she have been healed? No. I don't believe so. I think, this is my personal opinion, I think as Christians we miss out on a lot of the things of God, not because God doesn't want it, not because maybe we don't even have faith for it in the sense that we, we don't believe in it, but because we don't pursue God until we receive it. In my life, I will tell you this. I will pursue God for the total restoration of my body until I'm six feet under. You know, I'm like that 40-year-old or guy who was 40 years, you know, at the gate beautiful. It's been like 40 years for me. I've had good times. I've had bad times. I will pursue God and trust him in my life for the complete total restoration of my body until the day that I die. Because I am absolutely convinced that healing is the children's bread and I being a child of his should be healed. And that Jesus Christ bore the stripes on his back that I may walk in a place of healing. You say, well, why hasn't it happened? I don't know. I leave that to him. It's not my place. I just don't make excuses for it. So here's the thought that I have for you today as we kind of come to the end of this, this service, as the end of this message. Are you pressing in? Are you pressing through? And what are you pressing in and pressing through for? Don't give up. Don't give up on the relationships. Don't give up on finding the job. Don't give up on the salvation of your family. Don't give up. Pursue God. Pursue what he has for you. Look to him. Fight the good fight of faith. Praise the Lord. I trust that encourages you this morning.